one interesting new phenomenon within the indigenous videos that I've been able to see is the retelling of history. So telling either the creation story from the community or telling uh, the context story but from the other side. So a few of the collectives have taken archival footage, the ethnographic material of the first contact, especially in Brazil, and taken it back and put it up in a big screen in the public square so people can watch it and have the elders remember. Because some of the contact in the Amazon was as late as 1968 for some of the people. And in other groups, it hasn't happened yet, no? But they know of what happens with contact with other groups. So it's the retelling of contact as that foundational moment when everything changed, right? So that's one way. And another way is to recreate the traditional stories that are in danger of being lost by the loss of the elders. So video is being used as a historical memory, as a way to uh, interpret history, reinterpret history, and to keep thinking about history. So it's very important to return the image. So this can work through photography, archival photography, archival film, and the uh, elders in one community even reenacted and retold the story and remembered what they were doing that day, how it smelled, how it felt, what they did, where they ran. And there's something very empowering about recovering that. And unfortunately, you know, much of the history is related to the land and the land has been lost. So communities that still have the traditional territory are in a position that's very different from communities that have been displaced from their original territory. So those are foundational issues that have to do with the larger issues of extraction, of uh, colonization, right, of disenfranchisement. And it's a little bit different from what we see in North America and what we see in South America. I think there's more political awareness in general in Latin American countries, so they can tie it to a history of struggle with the state because the, the history of colonialism is, is also expressed in the church and religion and in, and in many layers. Okay? And what happens in North America is a bit different because they're supposed to be self-determined, but they're in a bigger machine, right? So I think the, the perspectives are, are very different, whereas Latin American indigenous communities know that they're in a line of struggle that their brothers are facing in the other countries. So there's a sort of subconscious collective that is alert to all these stories and wants to also listen. Sometimes for the filmmakers, making the decision of who is the director is just a detail because it's a community project and somebody will be the lighting director, somebody will be the sound director, and somebody will be the director of the film, but it's, it's not as much at stake, at least in the beginning. Uh, it's, it's the later uh, circulation in festivals that, that complicates that and creates a reverse impact in the community when one person of that circle starts getting too much attention. That sometimes is problematic and that creates internal strife. So that's why um, directing, quote unquote directing, becomes a rotational position. And all of, the, all of the trainees, for example, in the project in Bolivia, they are not specialized yet. They are more like rotational and they travel to different parts of the country, so it's physically rotational. And then the roles are also switched. And so you may get to be a director and then you'll be a sound person, you know, totally unrelated. And that, that's unfortunate in the sense that there's not enough uh, training and equipment and infrastructure to go around for people to actually find their calling and develop a specific skill. But increasingly there are internships and training at film schools where people can start learning, oh, I'm actually really involved in editing, this is my thing, and develop their eye. But of course you can identify within the community, sometimes people come up and they have a flair. And it's the trainers that have that responsibility of identifying that and trying to foster that and, and dr drive that to a, a position of greater um, uh, mastery or skill over that particular aspect. But in general, it's such a community experience um, that few people even own their own equipment. I mean, we share everything. We share the computers. Share, I, I was in a film festival and somebody handed me a cell phone. Hey, there's a call for you. It's, it's all connected. And it does, like I said, it does bring issues of conflict. And applying for a film festival to submit is even a problem sometimes because it says director. So in Bolivia, in this, in this project that I'm mentioning, Safrek and Kaib, a, a collaborative uh, project, they designate not a director, they designate a responsable. 
the person who's responsible for it. Just like you would be the responsable for organizing a feast or the responsable for tending a fire. You're just the responsible. So in that way, it fits very well with more traditional institutions of power, which are, for example, um, rotational. You may be tasked, like just declared by the community, you are in charge of water this season, and that's your role, or you're in charge of education. And those are uh, assumed as part of your community work, part of your work towards the community well-being. So there's a talk of wellness that's very interesting that's appearing in Quechua and, and, and other in Mexico, for example, bienestar, wellness, um, the idea of the, create, the, the common good. So you're expected to give your own work for the common good. And filmmaking increasingly is being accepted by the communities as a common good, as a, as a project just as valid as clearing a field or cleaning the cemetery, making a film can also be a, a common good project. I think film is having a very important role in witness, you know, witnessing, in uh, being, like I said, a newsreel for an undocumented community, basically. Undocumented in the sense that it's not of interest to the public sphere. So uh, media is being used literally as a shield in many situations. For example, in the Amazon, um, there was the case of uh, a massacre in uh, Peru. And then they went back and did a documentary about it. But otherwise, it falls off the radar. So it's a way of um, bringing into the public sphere and providing B-roll later for when it does come back up. They've got a story and they have a position. That's important. Uh, a second element is uh, to explain through the media their position. For example, in Colombia, the indigenous people are caught between a struggle of military violence, drug violence, and paramilitary violence. And that's really, a, that's really a, a very compromised position. And they've decided that if they perform any sort of uprising, armed, it's only going to give them arguments to completely eliminate them. So they made a film explaining what their staff of authority means. Because when they march, they have an indigenous guard around the march. And the indigenous guard is composed of men, women, and children. And you can hear that, or you can see it. So when you see police violence, and you see who the violence is aimed against, and you see the men, women, and children, you understand the level of violence. And then they explain that they're not going to respond with violence, but they're going to respond with using their, their shield of the protection of their natural elected indigenous authority. And that's expressed through that staff. It's just a wooden staff, but it's not a weapon. It's not a weapon in the sense, in the physical sense, but it is in the metaphysical sense. So one of the films is just called that, saying, raised by our own authority. And it's about the, the authority staff and how it's used even though they include a sort of newsreel of the violence. And the same footage appears in three films because one of the invasions was very violent and they, they documented the whole thing. So they've gotten, three, they've gotten a lot of mileage out of it using it in three different documentaries. So that's, that's another way, just a first-person address to explain to the outside world. And that's why the, the issue of audience is important. There's videos made for inside and there's videos increasingly made to explain to the outside world what we're doing about climate change, why we think pesticides are destructive, why we need to protect our language, and how we protect our territory. So there's, there's a lot of films that have very little, literal names like that, like how we protected our territory. <laughs> but um, I think there's increasingly this uh, awareness that uh, television crews you know, have done a lot of damage to the indigenous people, but there's this idea that the same weapon can be used back. I think distribution is one of the biggest problems, which is why I write about this. I think uh, there's been much effort put into making the works, but not into making them circulate. And oftentimes they need a framework, which is what the festival gives. The festival gives a framework and explains the context. A lot of these works speak to very specific facts or happenings or actions. So in that sense, you need to know a lot about the community to understand the work sometimes. So the fact that there is no organized distribution process or channel, more than, more than a company, more than a commercial distribution, what we need are distribution channels. 
So internet is starting to be used more to upload films and certain communities have their own website, either in the name of an organization or in the name of the community. And they upload the films and you can follow, you can follow webcasts of gatherings, you can look at videos online, but it's very hard to purchase. So it's not circulating so easily through the institutional spaces. But oftentimes they work with NGOs and the NGOs will ship video, you know, the video will commercialize, will reproduce, will circulate the work through networks of activism and solidarity, right? But it's not hitting because of the whole issue of quality again. It's not shot in HD, it's shot on low, on low quality formats. So sometimes it's not gonna fit within the um, standards. The, the unfortunate thing is that the standards that they're being measured against are completely industrial. So that's what also inhibits some of the circulation. And I think we have to get over the idea of the perfect cinema. And, and, and Juan Salazar writes about imperfect media. And he compares indigenous video, not so much to fourth cinema, but to the idea of an imperfect cinema that just bypasses the whole Hollywood standard. And it doesn't mean that it can't reach that standard. And some people might even desire that standard. It's fine. But it's not, an, it's not compulsory. And it's not the standard that we're setting. So the standard is more about the ethics and the process and the content and not so much about the aesthetics. Mm -hmm. However, you can do guerrilla and, and revolutionary aesthetics and make a point, which I think the last film does, uh, day two, I think, is, is very liberated that way. So we, um, one of the problems that, that we have with distribution is that people don't want to lose control over the image. People want to uh, propagate the videos and have people know about the situation, but they don't want it to become a commercial product because so much uh, of the input, so much of the funding is in kind or produced by the community, it's such a collaborative effort, that who would you start to pay? Who will reap the actual, um, the actual money that's made? So that's the thing, you need to think of a plan of uh, how, to, how to recoup the money and put it back into the process. That would be really interesting to discover some sort of um, distribution process that would, I think, that would be more fair trade. That would be my example. No? But uh, distribution is still in consultation process in many places. And like I said, Video Nas Aldeas and a few other projects are starting to make discs, burn discs, and put them into formats and package them and send them out. But again, there's no critical review. It's not in any journal, you know, so-and-so launched this. You know, it's never going to have the level of impact. So that's what we're working on. We're working on trying to uh, create more scholarship and critical writing around this and the indigenous people themselves are working on creating their own media and they've been very successful. There's a newsletters, there's people who volunteer their translation skills to translate some of the news, they're using radio on the internet. So increasingly there is a sort of um, indigenous communication that's wider than just indigenous cinema or indigenous video. So indigenous video and cinema are sort of linked to this wider network of communicators that are doing that very day-to-day -day serious work of, of putting it on the radar, putting the news out there. And now the bulletins are coming out daily. You can get on, on, on listservs and get the indigenous news that increasingly has media bits, not just whole length documentaries. first things that's starting to happen that's very encouraging to me is that the indigenous leaders themselves, who are not connected to the indigenous video movement, are starting to realize the value of the films and the filmmaking. And that it's not just a cultural activity, that it's not just uh, folklore, right? Without being dismissive of it, but it's not just uh, that, it, that it actually is crucial. That media is hitting everybody and that this is a way to strike back. So the first thing that's happening is that there's, bec there's starting to be a dialogue between the communications offices of the indigenous regional and national and international organizations with the people who have the skill set and the people who have the experience doing indigenous video. So that's a conversation already that's crucial because the indigenous movement is starting to have a better platform, uh, beginning with the United Nations Permanent Forum. So. That's not enough. I think all the platforms are necessary. That's what I've heard indigenous journalists say. That every platform is valid. So the more we can uh, get this work to dialogue alongside other activist causes, other humanitarian causes, other women's causes, other language preservation causes, children, youth, everything. And I think that uh, the 
concern about the environmental situation is a very good starting point. I think it gives us a common critique of how dysfunctional the current system is.